first hour, we're going to talk about financing the grid. In the second hour, we're going to talk about controversies on the grid. Uh, and so I have a fair amount of view graphs. And next week, when Christine Halquist comes, she is not planning to use the view graphs. And I'm not planning to use any more group view graphs because it'll be mostly a discussion. But I'll take my laptop along in case someone says, hey, that view graph you showed, I, you know, I'll be able to access it. So this is, this is the heavy duty information day. Okay, moving along, hopefully. Uh, let's talk a little bit about a history. Can people see this or should I turn it over? Okay, okay, okay. Integrated utilities and RTOs. Back before 1999, there were not RTOs. Now we're going to spend our whole time talking about RTOs here, that is regional transmission organizations and independent system operators, and I'm going to refer to them both as RTOs, they're similar. Um, but back before that, what there were, were vertically integrated utilities. And frankly, in a lot of the country, there still are vertically integrated utilities. When a utility is vertically integrated, it owns the generation and it owns the transmission distribution, though it cooperates with other utilities on transmission, uh, you know, you, you, uh, because that, that is more than one utility wide. And in 1999, FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, set up RTOs as an option for groups to choose. And whether you have a RTO or not, the physical grid always needs to be balanced so there's always been dispatch of power plants. But RTOs added uh, market pricing and, and auctions and so forth, which is not the case in a vertically integrated utility. So let's talk about, these are the RTO areas of North America. Um, and this is the first uh, diagram. I just grabbed it off their website. And you can see that there's an awful lot of North America that isn't RTO but there's a lot of North America that is. So we're over here, I, I, I'm not gonna get up and stuff, but you can see that we're over in the little, one of the littlest RTOs, which is the New England, uh, ISO New England. And then New York has its own, state has its own ISO. And then the biggest one that we interact with a lot is uh, PJM, which is Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland, and a lot more. So those are the RTO areas. So let's look at integrated utilities. Let's look at how they were run in the past. Um, they owned everything, the generation, the power plants, and so forth, and the transmission lines. And they did the billing, OK? That's how they did it. Now, they were considered to be, and probably quite rightly, natural monopolies. You're only going to get one wire into your house, so you're going to buy from them. Unless you go off the grid, you're buying from them. That was the idea. So they were regulated by FERC and by state public service boards. Now, how did they work? They <coughs> provided you power and set a price for it. But the price was very carefully regulated, hopefully. It was, the, the utility was guaranteed a rate of return on its investment. So in other words, if it built a power plant, it could get whatever the public service board of that area felt was a proper rate of return. It could, it could make 4% on its investment in the power plant. What, I don't know what the percentage was. It was a low percentage, but it was steady as a rock, which meant that it was considered a great widows and orphan stock. It was practically like having uh, money in the bank and getting interest, OK? Um, so what set the rate? It was a rate of return on how much you built and how much pay, how, how many people you paid to, but mostly the, the statement was always rate of return on investment. And it was also uh, set on the basis of time online. If you had your people offline too much, the, the P Public Service Board would say, you know, you don't, you don't get people back online. You're not, you're not meeting our standards for reliability, and you're not going to get our top rate of return. So your rate of return is falling. Meet the standards for reliability and come back and we'll give you some more money for rate of return. So that's the incentives. So here are 
the incentives for integrated utilities. Build, perhaps overbuild, because the rate of return on investment, you build something else, you get a rate of return on it, okay? Um, and redundancy, don't go offline, because the rate of returns depends on not having too long outages for customers. So, in theory, it was somewhat expensive power, but very reliable, okay? That's the theory. I, what I mean by the theory is I want to show you later that I, I, w I would argue that it was somewhat expensive power, but anyway, I'll show you in a minute. It was also a good deal for widows and orphans, right? They, they, bought, the, they bought the stock and, and, and the Public Service Board guaranteed that they would not lose money on it. Meredith? Yes. Could you give me a sense how large these um, integrated utilities were? How many would fit into New Hampshire, for example? It depends. That's a really, really interesting question. That's a great question. And it's not a question I can answer easily. For example, during rural electrification, there were a lot of small rural electric cooperatives of which gazillions were fit into New Hampshire, okay? Uh, and uh, then in, in, um, in, uh, in uh, California, for example, uh, PG&E was an integrated utility which took up the, basically the top half of the state of California and everybody who lived there. Um, with little municipal utilities carved out from it, which is, because the utility, it's very hard to say anything universal about utilities, but I would say they range from tiny cooperatives to things like PG&E, and from anything from 15,000 or 5,000 customers to, you know, 20 million customers. Oh. It's worth, it, just a footnote is that a lot of what you've described also applied to the telephone system, AT&T, back before divestiture, back in the... Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right, and I will talk about that a little bit. The same, okay. Uh, not, not, I, that's a really good point. Okay, so why did people change from integrated utilities? Why, why did they go to RTOs? The major idea was that a marketplace would save money and that a guaranteed rate of return for the company supposedly meant higher prices for customers and competition would lower prices. But I just want to point out that as it happens, RTOs have not been less expensive for the consumer. And I'll show you a chart about that. Um, more co that's a, a top level analysis. More complicated analysis, more complex analysis can show some savings, but as top level, no. So let me just go forward to my top level slide for a minute and then I'll come back to it. Um, this is a chart of actual consumer prices. The chart was done by um, the business school at UC Berkeley and is included in a report uh, done for NESCO, which is the gov New England governor's group on utilities. I thought this would be better than it is. You'll see it under the thing. There's a there's a yeah, there's a red line at the top. Believe it or not, there is a red line at the top. This is the red line, and it is the um, the prices in restructured states with RTOs. That's the top line, and there's a blue line which you can barely see, and it is the prices in non-restructured states. Okay. So, I mean, I'm not, I, 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 when you get the slide at, at your, you're able to see it on the web, you'll be able to see this more clearly and, and so forth. But I just wanted to say that at a top level analysis, you can, the RTO states started out more expensive. Maybe that's why they went to RTOs. They said, we're getting ripped off. But the RTOs didn't seem to save the money in the long run. They kept, it, it, you know, I'm not able to do this very well, but if you just kind of look at the, you know, difference between RTO and not RTO, it isn't, and this is from 1990 to about 2012, 2014. So this is, if the RTOs were gonna save scads of money, they had 25 years to prove it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and. Uh, 
I'm very sorry about that slide. Yes. As a consumer, uh, if uh, I use more power, more megawatts, does my percentage rate go down? Oh yes, of course. In some, but in some cases, at least this is what they told me in Japan when I was there long ago, we used uh, electrical water heater, which was a big mistake. And the more power you demanded, the higher the rate was. Just, well, it, it, and they said, well, that's the same as it is for big businesses. No. 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 Big businesses, in general, get a better rate. And, and, and they get a better rate for some reasons that are, you know, like we want to encourage industry, but it's also, you only got to send one bill. You can also, in, you know, uh, it, you can also ask them to do certain things to condition the returning power, which makes it easier for the grid to operate. And I'm, I'm not going to go into that. But what I'm saying is, it's not totally crazy for a big business to to get a lower rate, um, and because uh, it's less expensive for the utility to supply them than to bill everybody all a little bit things. Okay, so now I will say that RTOs did encourage individual power plants to be more efficient. Um, for example, back in the days of integrated utilities, nuclear power plants took months to refuel. Now they take, now they set up a refueling schedule for tw that usually is something between 23 and 38 days and they have it choreographed and they bring in outsiders and what is the reason for that they get paid when they're online they don't get paid a rate of return they get paid when they're online and of course as the refueling uh, outages got shorter for utilities in uh, RTO areas where they don't get a rate of return then the people in the uh, integrated utility areas the public service boards we're no longer going to let their utilities take a couple months off. You know, that was no longer the standard for how a nuclear plant should operate. So RTOs did bring some efficiencies, but as I point out with this uh, slide, which you will get, which I'm very sorry it came out so dim. Um, the, uh, if you just look at the red line and the blue line, nothing else, RTOs tend to be more expensive. They started out more expensive and they still are. <coughs> so, now how do, the next thing I want, I'm going to be talking a lot about auctions. I'm going to be talking a lot about auctions. Oh my. But I just want to be sure that people understand that not all power on the grid is purchased through auctions. Um, power is purchased under contract and as well as through grid level auctions. But auctions are visible. You know, you were looking at the ISO New England thing and you could see the price all the time. That's an auction price. Power purchase agreements are not made public. They are considered to be uh, proprietary to the power plant uh, that, that, that is engaging in them and they are not made public. Um, now, power purchase agreements can be long-term, short-term, fixed price, or move with the market. I'll give you two examples of a long-term power purchase agreement is the uh, a power purchase agreement that um, uh, Vermont made with Vermont Yankee in 2012 and 2010 when when energy bought it and that agreement lasted to 2012 so that's a 10-year agreement that's that's a pretty long agreement uh, on the other hand there are plenty of agreements that are just a couple of months um, and that Vermont Yankee Agreement was a fixed price agreement. Uh, it, 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 it gained a little bit, uh, I, you know, it started out at four point something cents and went up to 4.8 cents or something over the 10 years. But then the recent uh, uh, agreements that Vermont made with Hydro-Quebec moved with the market. They are market, they're, they're based on the red rate in the auctions but with smoothing so that if there's a big hump, a spike one day, that doesn't get reflected immediately in the price that is paid. Um, so the, there are all kinds, of, you can make any kind of uh, agreement you want. I mean, it's a free country, you want to buy it, go buy it. Um, but um, auction prices will strongly influence the agreement prices because as you can imagine, 
let's, most of the agreements are not 10 years. And if you make an agreement for a year, and at the end of the year, your agreement, you say, okay, I'm, I'm paying for you at five cents per kilowatt, kilowatt hour, and I love it, let's renew it, and the price on the grid has gone up to eight cents, do you think the guy is gonna, who's selling you power is gonna say, yeah, I'm gonna sell you power below where I could get other places. No, he's gonna say, well, if you're not willing to go up to at least seven cents, why don't you go buy from the grid? So you see, the thing is that the, the power purchase agreements will move with the, um, with the, with the grid prices, yes? I'm not entirely clear on who all the players are in these auctions and agreements. I, I guess I understand that the power generators are selling, right? but it's not clear to me who is buying. You, you have Vermont HQ there. Who is that? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, don't, I might have written it wrong. Nobody, get, nobody would use it for me because I'm, uh, what I mean is when Vermont, Vermont, it should have had an apostrophe S. Vermont's Hydro-Quebec purchases move with the market. Oh. But who's, who's, who's the buyer? Who's the buyer? Who's the buyer? Who's the buyer? Green Mountain Power. Uh, all right. I'm, I need to sort that out. I mean, okay, let me see. The next slide might help if you can see it. Can you see this? Can you see this, please? Oh, hi. No, oh, it's a little better. A little better. Oh. Can you enlarge it? No. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, this is from the Green Mountain Power website. And it shows their fuel mix as of 2016, where they're buying the power, okay? Where they're buying. And 53%, okay, 23% is from large hydro. This is Green Mountain Power buying Hydro-Quebec power, 23%, okay? Uh, this is nuclear. Um, it is, uh, Seabrook and Millstone, I believe, that they're buying 14% uh, of the power on contract. These are contracts, okay? There's a contract with Hydro Quebec. There's a contract with, uh, with uh, Seabrook and, and Millstone. And then 9% uh, uh, is uh, local hydro, okay? The contracts. They have contracts to buy at a certain rate. And then about 2% or 1% here are other renewables. But the thing I wanted to show you here is that 53% is what they call market purchases. And that means that it's either bought at the ISO New England auctions, okay, or it's bought on very short contracts that basically reflect the price of the ISO New England auctions. So we're going to be talking about the auctions extensively. But you should remember that at least for, um, for uh, Green Mountain Power and for other, only half the power is bought that way. The rest is bought under contract. Yes? So is it just in New Hampshire or is Vermont the same that as a consumer, an individual consumer, we can pick our source of our electricity, therefore what we lock into for our rate? Does, does Vermont have that? No, Vermont does not have that. But New Hampshire does. New, New Hampshire, Hampshire does. does. And meanwhile, you're, if, if someone sets up a business to be an electricity provider in New Hampshire and says, okay, I'm going to sell to customers, then they go in and they do the equivalent of Green Mountain Power. They say, I'm going to buy at the market, right. or I'm going to say, I'm going to, I, I think I can get a good contract with, uh, with Hydro Quebec. Or whatever. Remember, today we're mostly talking about money flows on the market. If there's a guy in New Hampshire who's decided he can get a good contract with Hydro Quebec, it's not going to be, uh, that would be an unlikely scenario, but it's not going to be that all of a sudden power is going to be shooting down from, from uh, Quebec to his, his house. Right. Okay. This but is I mean, about money. And then, then seasonally, because I'm in New Hampshire and I watched some of the markets last year, you know, is there an optimum time to purchase? Because, well, you, see, you know, the problem is that that goes down to the state level. and I. I'm already crunched on this course, so I don't yeah, want to, no, no, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm not going to give it as detailed an answer as you like. Some states make <laughs> rules that you can only, if you're an independent supplier, such as like Liberty Utilities or whatever, you can only make six-month contracts. 
And that's the state rule. That has nothing to do with ICE New England. ICE New England could care less. But some states make rules about how long a contract certain kinds of entities can make. And I just don't want to go into that because I just, I just don't know enough. I feel like if I'd given this course, and maybe I should have, as twice as long, I could have assigned a project to people, find out your state rules, tell me the Vermont rules, tell me the, you know, but, but anyway, uh, I would say that big utilities tend to buy a mix of contracts and, um, and, uh, and, and auctions. So let's go on to the energy auctions, and now I've spent almost half an hour before getting to the main topic. Okay, I'm going to shoot myself. Okay, the clearing price is central. So let's say ISO New England knows that the grid needs 700 megawatts. I'm just saying that to make nice numbers. So they say, okay, it's an auction. Now the auctions are for five minutes each, so that's why I don't have kilowatt hours here. I'm just trying to get it clear what, what goes on. Okay, ISO New England says, I need 700 megawatt. Plant A says, I'm bidding in 300 megawatts at $20 a megawatt hour. Plant B says, I'm bidding in 200 megawatts at $30 a megawatt hour. Plant C says, yes, I'm bidding in two, 300 megawatts at $40 a megawatt hour. Okay, so the, as you would expect, the RTO starts with the cheapest one, buys 300 megawatts from plant A, 200 from plant B, and only needs 200 from plant C. Now here's the part that people just kind of go like, you really? <laughs> they bought, RTO bought, 700 megawatts, and for every one of those megawatts, it's paying $40 per megawatt hour. That is the clearing price. That's how the auctions work. Why? Take Why? Me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question, but the idea is that if you're going up to the $40 plant, you've got some kind of condition of scarcity, and if you didn't do it this way, Everybody would be would be kind of jockeying around saying, okay, I'll sell my power to you at $20 an hour from uh, 6 a.m. To, to 7 a.m. And then I'm going to sell it to you from 7 a.m. To, uh, to 8 a.m. at $80 an hour. And then I'm going to drop it down again. So this way, plants bid in, and if there's scarcity, they all get the high price and they don't all have to constantly jockey around trying to figure out how much to bid in. <coughs> But people go like, you could get it for 20 and you're paying 40, and the answer is yeah. Okay, and <coughs> when you saw these kinds of charts, um, and I, I hope this shows up, but um, this was a really uh, low price day on the grid, and in and, 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 and Vermont, um, the top bid was uh, uh, for about 1475 and 76, and it, 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 you had, Hampshire, no, in Vermont, in, in New Hampshire, it was a little less, and down here in Connecticut was $15. And, and these are what's called local marginal prices pricing because the price in the locality depends on the, the plants in that locality and, 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 and so forth. And my, my greatest apologies for the slides, but you will see them on the, um, you will see them really uh, nicely <laughs> come to work. Okay, so let's talk about this bidding for a minute. Let's talk about incentives and Enron and RGOs. And uh, remember before there was an incentive to have overpriced uh, but very reliable power. Now if you remember, the first place that got uh, RTO was California, California ISO. And the first thing that happened was rolling blackouts. <laughs> I was there at the time. Anyway, so the power plant owners want high clearing prices, right? Even if they're bidding in at 20, if the clearing price is 100, that's great. Now, how do you get a high clearing price? Scarcity. So Enron was indeed uh, uh, manipulating the grid by taking plants offline, having a condition of scarcity that led to high prices for them, and it led to rolling blackouts for everybody. So Enron did game, game the system. Plants offline, high prices, yum yum, lots of profits. I just want to point out that that kind of gaming is only possible with an RTO. Uh, it wouldn't have been impossible with an integrated utility because if the customers go offline, they make less money. 
But with an RTO, uh, how the grid works really is not their department <coughs> the power plant. If you own a power plant, you want to get high prices for it. <coughs> if, if the grid needs more power, well, maybe they can pay for it. That is very, very uh, cynical, but here we go. Okay, now here's a power graphic. This is a graphic that you've seen before, and it just shows um, the demand on the grid <coughs> during the course of the day. This is a day, and this is about uh, two in the afternoon, and this is well, midnight, and this is midnight over here, and this is the amount of demand on the grid on, on, on this particular day. Now, one of the things you'll notice is there's always 10K of megawatts demand on the grid, but sometimes there's up to 15K. Now what that means, what that means is that some plants don't run all the time. Base load plants run all the time, but if you're over here, you run when the grid calls you, which is part of the time. And if you're an expensive plant, then you only run over here when there's a lot of demand on the grid and the grid calls you. So that ended up being that energy auctions aren't enough. If your plant doesn't run all the time, there are no guarantees, buddy. You are not guaranteed how much it will run or how much it will be paid when it does run. So if you own that plant, you're going like, should I maintain this plant? What's the grid going to do? And you're going to make an assessment. And so you could end up with a shortage of available power on the grid. And so. The first thing that happened was the answer on our grid, and on many grids, is a forward capacity auction. And I want to point out that not all RTOs have that. I believe that the Texas RTO does not have this. And I only, I didn't look that up, I admit it. But I was in a meeting where they said, oh, those Texans, they don't even have forward capacity auction. They're real cowboys down there. <laughs> uh, so the idea being that they just look the prices of the kilowatt hours rise high enough so that people uh, will keep their plants up. They don't do it, or they don't do a forward capacity auction. So here we go about forward capacity markets, and I may begin to um, skip some of this, but I, I'll try to go in. You bid into a capacity market three years in advance, and you are paid for your capacity, your nameplate megawatts, not for your kilowatt hours produced. A, a plant with a high capacity factor and a low capacity factor gets the same forward capacity market payment. So let's say you have a 300 megawatt peaker, peaker plant. It runs 15% of the time. It's very expensive. It gets the same capacity payment as a 300 megawatt coal plant running 75% of the time. And these capacity payments are to provide the incentive to keep up the maintenance of plants with low utilization, in theory at least. And I just, this is, I'm going to just run this by quickly, but uh, it's just sort of to explain some things that you might have seen in the press and you don't know what they mean. Um, when Bill Moyle uh, announced that Pilgrim was closing, he said, we can close any time in the next four years if the company finds a way to meet its commitments to ISO New England. And then more recently he said, we will run to 2019 to fulfill our commitments to ISO New England. And what he meant by that is this plant bid into the Ford capacity auction, which is three years in advance, and therefore we have to run to 2019 because we are getting capacity payments to, to then, and I cannot, we cannot find somebody who will take over this obligation for those capacity payments. We can't find a plant that will do it, so we have to keep running. Meredith, what is Pilgrim? What? What is Pilgrim? Oh, I'm so sorry. Pilgrim is a nuclear plant on Cape Cod that is going to be closed in 2019. And when it was announced in 2015 that it was going to close, they said, we're going to close it, we're losing money, but we don't know when we're going to close it because we have an ISO obligation till 2019. And the obligation was the forward capacity market that they had signed up for. Okay. And here's another, another this, this was in the past, but here we go. In 2010, there was a vote against Vermont Yankee in the Senate. 
Vermont Yankee was concerned that it would not be allowed to continue to run. <coughs> so it went to ISO New England and said, we wish to delist from the core forward capacity market. We do not wish to get capacity payments for um, three years in advance because we might be shut down there and we don't know what we would do about that and we'd have to pay fines or something. So please let us delist. We're, we're not bidding in. And ISO sort of said, no, you're bidding in. We, we, we can't make you bid in, but we really, I don't know what they did to make them bid in, but anyway, I said New England insisted that this is from, um, this is from newspapers at the time, that ISO New England said, if ISO's reliability analysis shows the resources needed, it is not allowed to withdraw from the capacity market. Well, it, it can withdraw, actually. I, I don't know if that's a really reasonable quote. But what I'm trying to say is these four capacity markets are important, and plants take them very seriously, and ISO takes them very seriously. And I'm not going to really talk more about that one because I'm just trying to give you the idea of that they're three years in advance and they, <coughs> the plant incurs an obligation. Capacity auctions are confusing. And the, in the comfort of numbers, plants bid in three years ahead. They bid in nameplate capacity, not kilowatt hour delivered. And once again, it all goes by the clearing price. The most expensive bid in becomes the price that all plants get for the, their capacity. Going like that is crazy. Okay. Anyways, so is there uh, a problem with coercion when the people <laughs> yeah, just right. to jack up the price and right. honest to goodness, I, I, I can't into the golf field and we right. talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? If we find something. I don't that, know. I don't know. I, I will tell you about the energy. Uh, when we get a little further, I'll tell you a little about the energy auctions and the energy auctions. People say they're markets, but they're not really markets in a sense because obviously uh, they're markets because there's some kind of auction and you either get picked or you don't get picked. But ISO New England controls what you can bid in. And uh, so, uh, you know, you can't decide. The good news is that if there's a high price on the grid, you get it even if you're a low price plant. The bad news is you cannot decide what to bid in. ISO will decide it for you. You mean, in other words, they disclose their true cost for... Yes, they disclose their true cost, their heat rate, and so forth. And let me, let me point out something else, that basically, if you're a, a nuclear plant or a coal plant or a, a uh, hydro plant, you're stuck. ISO knows your heat rate, ISO knows what your fuel cost, and you can bid in what you're going to bid in. One of the things that tilts the grid toward natural gas is ISO considers fuel costs. So when the price of natural gas goes up, the plant goes to ISO and says, I'm bidding in higher, and then I say, yeah, of course, of course you are. So uh, this is, uh, you know, <coughs> it's, it's just kind of an interesting uh, side effect of these auctions. So I'm going to go to another uh, Plants that run a lot at low percentage, plants that run a lot have a low percentage of the power money from capacity and a high percentage from energy, and plants that run a little have a high percentage from capacity and low percentage from energy. And finally, you're going to figure out what this graphic is. <laughs> it's taken weeks, but we've gotten back to this graphic. And if you remember, I said this was a dual fire oil natural gas gas turbine. And this is what 100% of, of its payments come from. And the blue is capacity payments. The little gold part at the bottom is actually selling kilowatt hours. And the, the, the dark part at the top, I really will not get into, but that is auxiliary payments, which means that it, it, it's uh, like reserve <coughs> payments and things like that. There's something called ancillary services payments, <clears throat> and it's basically mostly about keeping the plant hot to go on quickly. 
and 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 that's what that uh, dark area at the top is. But the main thing that we're going to talk about, because really, it's hard to go through all this stuff, is that this is a plant, and it's getting the gold area at the bottom by selling kilowatts, and it's getting the blue area in the middle from the capacity auctions. And now I'm going to use another slide, which is one of the slides that Bill Moyle uh, uh, put together in his uh, press release when he announced that um, Pilgrim Power Plant in Cape Cod was cl going to close. And um, when I saw that, I thought, boy, this is one of the best slides I've ever seen. And I asked Entergy for permission to use it, and they gave it to me. And Entergy, uh, I don't know if they you they certainly own Pilgrim and Vermont Yankee. Uh, I think at the time he gave his talk, they also owned a combined cycle gas power plant in, I believe, Rhode Island. But they've sold that since. I, I, I'd have to look that up. But they, they, they're not just a nuclear place. So here is energy prices and revenues. So I don't know, can you see this? Yeah. Okay. The nuclear plant, <coughs> you can see all the uh, um, green area. That's the price it gets from selling kilowatt hours on the grid. The blue area is the price it gets for capacity. Now it gets the same for capacity as any other plant in the same size. It just happens to sell a lot of kilowatt hours. <coughs> so let me ask you, if you have a nuclear plant and the capacity prices go up but the kilowatt hour prices go down, are you a happy camper? Mm -hmm. But if you're over in the middle here, let's look at um, what we saw before, which was uh, the, um, <clears throat> this is the same one we saw before, actually, with a, a natural gas, oil-fired uh, gas turbine. This is its capacity payments. This is its kilowatt hours payments. If kilowatt hour prices go up and capacity prices go down, is this guy happy? No, he's not happy. He wants high capacity prices. The nuclear plant and the uh, combines and the, the natural gas combined cycle plant want high um, high uh, kilowatt hour prices. This is too much, Meredith. Why did you give this class? <laughs> <laughs> I can only agree with you. Excuse me. The combined cycle. How would that be defined? Um, most. Gas fire plants are inexpensive little things that basically are the equivalent of a jet engine that runs a, a yeah. turbine. Okay, that's a straight cycle. The heat coming out of the uh, jet engine is pretty hot. Right. In a combined cycle plant, you also put a um, heat a, heat, a, a a steam vent generator right. at the end, and you raise steam which means that a combined cycle plant can be used for base load much more readily than, uh, well, it is used for base load already, which is why it gets such a high um, percentage of energy payments because it runs more. It's instantaneous, basically. Well, the, the gas turbine part is instantaneous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you notice, it gets very small amount of ancillary <coughs> payments compared to the gas turbine, because the, an, and so the gas turbine is quick on. Yeah, I'm, I'm there for you. Speaking of there for you, uh, the cap, a quick capacity calculation, you can look at this another time, that a nuclear plant at 90% capacity factor making certain assumptions, we'll get 1.5 million for capacity, 13 million for energy. A combined cycle plant at 50% capacity factor would get 1.5 million for capacity, 6 million for energy. And a peaker plant would get much more for energy capacity and very little for energy comparatively. And I won't go through this. Okay, and the capacity option, you are going, this is more for you to read at home. More for the students. Um, you are going to meet uh, Mary Nora of uh, ISO New England. She's going to give the first hours class uh, at when we take the tour. 
And uh, I decided to quote here her uh, email to me about capacity auctions, which is basically that high prices at capacity auctions encourage new plants to bid in, saying, yes, I'll be online by then, and I want that money, I'm guaranteed it. And as she writes here, um, and you can read at home, uh, capacity prices are expected to clear, remember clearing prices, at or near cone. Cone is cost of new entry. With a clearing price of $7 per kilowatt month, we saw the entry of three large dual fuel natural gas fired power plants at the last capacity auction. So three new power plants bid in, they're natural gas fired plus backup oil. And uh, they bid in at the last capacity auction because the clearing price was close to the cost of a new inexpensive plant. I wanted to, now we'll, uh, <laughs> Okay, capacity auctions can be misleading. Gas-fired plants in the Northeast bid into the capacity market. By bidding into the capacity market, they say, we'll be there for you. You give us our capacity payments, and we will go online when you're called. We're called to do it. But then, they didn't have firm gas uh, supply contracts, so, during the polar vortex, they were like, we'll be there for you if we can get the gas. That's what we meant. That's what we meant, don't you get it? <laughs> that is being very cynical. But it is basically what happened. So this, uh, a certain amount of misery ensued, and um, no gas can't run, sorry. And th therefore, the capacity auctions misled ISO into how many plants would be available when they were needed. Was the gas literally not available or was it just very expensive? It was sometimes one, sometimes the other, but basically uh, gas pipelines are required to supply individual homes before they supply. Um, uh, the idea is somebody might freeze in their home, but a power plant's a big boy and can take care of itself and get an alternate fuel and the grid can call something else on. So basically, the homes got the first cut of the supply. Is this why then, like um, Liberty, also put in a seasonal rate because we jacked it up and said, oh yeah, we have this November to May. That's which, right. Which had not been there before. That's right. Oh, the, yes, that absolutely. Was, that, was a, that was a consequence of this. Yeah. So here's the situation where you take the money and don't run where the grid operator was faced with a reliability issue with the gas plants not going on. So the, the lack of availability. So the, the idea was that they would put together something called paper performance. And, and the idea is that when a power plant doesn't run, it pays part of its, and it's called on, it pays part of its capacity payment to a power plant that does run. And the, the, this, this was a miserable formula. Let me just say that I am not going to, I didn't even try. There's a very complex formula about how that money gets transferred. And if you want, maybe we should have another course called Reports from the, from the Class. Somebody figure that one out, okay? Then we can report on it. Be good. Uh, just like the statewide stuff. But you see, you can't even understand what that formula is about unless I give this overview. So that's why I'm doing it. So the, the formula was a, a bone of contention and, and, and being reviewed by every, every possible interested party. And meanwhile, the next winter was coming up. And so they put together, I said New England put together the winter reliability projects, which were basically stopgap projects where they paid for oil and gas storage. Uh, at, so that it, even if you couldn't get it from the pipeline, you kept ISO would pay you to keep oil on site or to keep uh, liquefied natural gas on site. So you can't get it from the pipeline. You just go and you, you pull it from your own site. Um, and that, was, uh, that will end with when paper performance comes in. Um, I just want to say that when they put these winter reliability projects in, uh, things were not happy with FERC because FERC looked and said, you know, 
You're ISO New England. You're supposed to be fuel neutral. You're not supposed to be send, spending money on oil and natural gas. You're not supposed to say, yeah, then we'll, we'll send some extra money that way. So the paper performance is supposed to be fuel neutral. But it isn't really fuel neutral. I am beginning to see the, the whole RTO situation as tweaks are us because a paper performance um, is basically encouraging dual fuel gas-fired plants, and that's basically it. The, the formula does not help a steam plant which provides power all the time at all. So it isn't paying for a steam plant performance. It's only paying for a, a I can come up to speed fast plant performance to keep extra fuel around. Uh, here's a chart that you probably can't see, but it shows that gas and electricity prices are closely linked. The, uh, the blue line is, um, is uh, gas prices and the, and the uh, yes, and the, which is it? Oh, Meredith. Anyway, the blue line is gas prices and the, um, and no, the, the gold line is gas prices and the uh, blue line is electricity prices on the grid. And if you're a little astigmatic, uh, they could look like one line. <laughs> they are basically, uh, it is basically close, that close. And again, I was saying, it isn't a market as most people think of a market, because a power plant can't bid in as, in as it chooses to bid, as Mary Noir of ISO said. Uh, in our market, the generator offers, these are the kilowatt hour offers, include their startup costs, their load, no load costs, their energy costs. We have an internal market monitor to monitor these office offers and make sure that they resent, <coughs> represent the fair market price based on the fuel costs. So I, let, me, let me glance ahead to see what I'm... <coughs> ah, thank God I'm almost done. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, now let's look at bidding negative. In 2014, um, I still allowed people to bid in negative to the uh, to the uh, auctions. That is, they can bid in and say, "I'll pay you five cents to take my power." Thank you. I really want to pay you five cents to take my power. Um, and renewable plants bid in negative because they get payments other than capacity and kilowatt hours. As a matter of fact. Renewable plants can't bid in very well to the capacity <coughs> auctions. So that assumes that when ISO says you, they'll say yes, because they can't make the wind. They can't make the sunshine and not be cloudy. But they do repay, repay, receive payments for renewable energy certificates, which are generated. This is a policy thing, right? Remember, it's a policy thing. They generate a kilowatt. They also generate a certificate. Somebody buys a certificate. So they get an income from that. They also get production tax credits of about two cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, that's a federal, a federal thing. And okay, we're going back to this slide, and I'm 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 really sorry about about how much I'm trying to give you all at once. But um, here is a renewable plant over here, and. Um, here is what it's getting from uh, production tax credits and uh, rec sales, just the wind plan. Little tiny amount from capacity payments and then kilowatt hour payments. Okay. So here's a, plants are about to bid, bid negative and uh, up to 15 cents per kilowatt hour. They don't bid that low. I mean, they don't bid, uh, 15, I'll pay you 15 cents to take my power. They don't do that. Uh, but this scenario does happen. A wind turbine is getting paid two cents per kilowatt hour for production tax credit. It's getting, say, five cents per kilowatt hour for a renewable energy certificate. It costs it two cents to operate. But it doesn't get that the production tax credit or the renewable energy certificate unless it is actually operating. So it can bid in a negative four cents and make a one cent uh, per kilowatt profit. So it says, okay, I'm getting two cents plus five cents. Got it. I'm getting seven cents. 
it cost me two cents to operate, got it. So if I bid it, so at that point, uh, I, I'm getting five cents per kilowatt hour without selling a kilowatt hour. I'm not selling anything, I'm just getting, the, the, the protection tax credit plus the renewable energy certificate are my sources for that seven cents. And of course the cost of operating is the source of my two cents. So I'll bid in four cents, negative. I'll say, take my, take, my, uh, take my power and I'll pay you four cents to do it. And then it will have one cent per kilowatt hour profit. And I am, I'm really sorry. So I think that basically, this is the last slide and I'm sure you're all grateful. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, it is a market at a certain level and at a certain level, it isn't. I said New England controls what different power plants can be in. Low prices on the grid don't necessarily mean low prices to consumer. Let's say that's wind turbine. That wind turbine's bidding in at negative four cents. It can't really do that except some, a power, some other utility is paying it the five cents for the credit. That utility is in a state that has a renewable portfolio standard. It has to buy credits. It's buying the credits. So you're going to look at the LMP charts and say, oh, look how cheap the price is out of the grid. Meanwhile, off in the background, the utility is paying five cents per kilowatt hour for the wind energy, but it isn't showing up at the grid price. So let me just say that the vertically integrated model, winter reliability, that's not really a market and the complex fines set up for paper performance, like I say, look it up, send us all an email about it, I'm eager to learn, but basically that's not a market either. When the, when the incentives get that complex, it's not really a market incentive. And finally, I'm going to just end up by saying I've spent most of my time bashing the RTO situation, but I assure you that uh, vertically integrated also had its problems. And I think we should take a break now, but think <laughs> about what incentives would you choose for the grid? And that's basically it. Yeah. I have a decent concept, I think, of how the electricity gets purchased and sold uh, from ISO. You know, all those people in the room, 24-7, uh, the great big blue board that you show. I have no concept whatsoever about who runs the joint and handles the money. Uh, what is ISO at that level? I don't, um, Who makes these decisions? Well, the decisions are made by computers. <laughs> 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 Basically, um, as ISO is, is controlling what people bid in at by, by knowing how much their uh, heat rate is and their fuel costs are and so forth, the uh, ISO predictions are figuring out how much they've got to buy. And uh, then the higher price uh, uh, plants are bought when there's, uh, ISO starts by deploying the low price plants, but then gives the everybody the clearing price of the higher price plants. And how the actual money flows around, I think it flows through ISO, but only through ISO in terms of computer transfers. But who yeah, monitors but those questions. computers? Right. Who's ISO the person? What's, is there a commissioner? Is there a utility board? Who makes those decisions? That's his question. Is it a not-for-profit or just a regular board? Okay, ISO is a not-for-profit and it is supported through a sort of an ISO tax on everybody's utility bills in, in, the, in, in New England. And, and um, how it got to be this way, remember when I showed that graph the first time and I said, this is all policy. I, Howard's going to tell you about electrons. I'm telling you that this is the payment for capacity and this is the payment for kill. That's all policy. And how that happened, I don't know exactly how it grew up. Why, why doesn't Texas care about capacity auctions and so forth? I would say that as consumers, you are bluntly a rare group of consumers to know this much about it. And I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to 
boast how great it's been to find out something, but most consumers have no idea what this is, what this is about. Do you think it was spurred on by the brownouts in our city? Well, all of these posts from, I think it was the 70s or 60s, late 60s? Well, yeah, they, they basically did. Yes, the, the, the I mean, brownouts so made a difference. Uh, Enron made a difference. Uh, I think that the business about we tell you how much you can bid in was uh, let's not have Enron happen again, uh, and so forth. So yeah, the, the, I can't I can't even begin to. But in essence, this is like the commodity market, just like Chicago is the commodities market, and yet it's energy, but it's regulatory to ensure that the consumers don't get bent over. Anyway, it's it's to try to make it even. They try to make it even, but as yeah. I say, it's always it's, it seems to be tweaks are us. I mean, right. you yes. you know, they oh we'll, we'll fix it. We'll have a capacity auction. Well, I'm bidding in. Oh, but I can't get gas. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> then they have to add something to that, right? Now then they get the paper performance or the winter reliability projects. So it 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 it. it, it it, it begins to be, in my opinion, quite a structure and not really, we're going to have competition and it's gonna, we're going to just save, save a fortune. So that gets back to that picture with the RTO areas are still more expensive than the non-RTO areas. There's so many controversies in so little time. <laughs> Integrating renewables, net metering, and paying for transmission are three major controversies. So I just want to say that I'm, I want everybody, I'm going to go around the room and ask everybody to answer with two or three words, because there's a lot of time taken. But I know a lot of acronyms, but is that the point? Airline deregulation was a great success. Phone company deregulation was a great success. Well, let's raise our cell phones to that. <laughs> but why is regulating, deregulating the grid so hard? So I'm going to just, before we start the controversies, I want everybody to tell me in like a phrase, if I was dictator of the grid, it would be more. What would it be more? I can't comment. I'm screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> Be what, more understandable. More understandable. Yeah. So, for the common person. Really, that I think that's the answer I'm going to go with for the rest of it. I'm going to supposedly ask everyone, but can people just volunteer a couple? Yeah, of no, that, I would agree with with that. That's a fabulous answer. If you were a dictator, though, you wouldn't want people to know. To know. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. If you were a manager, you would, but not a dictator. Yeah. I don't want you to know what's going on if I'm a dictator. If I manage the grid, it would be more. Yes. But no, really, it is a kind of a dictator situation <coughs> because let's face it, ISO makes these rules about the auctions, right? And why do they have an auction if they're making the rules? I don't get this auction. Well, they need an auction. But I don't know why they go to the higher price. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Moving along to controversies. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Let's start with the controversy about renewables and integrating renewables. Now, this That's is everything I have uh, said so far. I have really tried to be very, very clear when I have my opinions and when it's just facts. In this case, I want to state something which is an, a very strong opinion of mine. Renewable is a brand name. Renewable is not something real. If you go and you look at what are the renewables running on the grid right now, you will discover that burning refuse is the highest percentage of renewables on the grid right now. I don't consider that particularly renewable. I'm not against it. I'm just saying, so how did that get to be called renewable? When you talk about the grid, you mean ISO New ISO New England. When I, I'm sorry, you are absolutely right. When an ISO New England, burning refuse is usually the highest uh, renewable percentage on the grid. Meanwhile, big hydro is not just described as renewable, though heaven knows the water keeps falling from the sky <laughs> and the rivers keep running. I, so, I, can I respectfully disagree? Okay. Because <laughs> refuse is renewable. There, We can always create more trash. Mm -hmm. We cannot create more oil, gas, coal. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's renewable. It doesn't mean it's 
it doesn't mean it's improving global warming or anything else. It simply means that it's like trees. It's like wood. Wood is renewable because we can grow more trees, but we can't grow more fossil fuels. Well, why is it water? I would say it is. You mean I would hydro? say it is too. Yes. Mm. But it's not listed as renewable in many cities. But in a sense, it takes oil or petroleum to produce trash. That may be, but we can, well. Okay, <laughs> I, let's, I, we'll, we'll never get past this. I, I have my opinion, I, I share it. <laughs> so the controversy is about integrating intermittent renewables. Re refuse and, and biomass are heat engines. They're not that different from a coal or nuclear plant and how they operate. There are no particular problems with integrating them to the grid. So there are, uh, here's an intermittent grid, and the, the famous two ducks, well actually, usually there's only one duck. I'm expected the second duck. I'm proud of the second duck. Uh, the solar duck curve, and in a way there's a nighttime duck. The wind blows mostly at night, and in the old days only base load plants were running at night. So here we go for the, the ducks, the duck situation. Remember this graphic, you, you've seen it many times. Down at uh, 10K uh, and, and so forth, that's the base load plants and they're running even in the middle of the night and then the other plants are coming on to follow load. And here's, uh, you saw in Howard's presentation where um, if you compare it to this curve, you see the, 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 the um, this is in New England the yellow gold area is what the curve would have been like except that solar photovoltaic is being used in people's homes and so it, it isn't going up as high as it would have. So the difference between where the curve is and where it would have been with, without solar photovoltaic is, um, is the, the, the uh, golden area. Now remember that at the base, this is uh, 9,000 megawatts, and at the top, it's 13,000 megawatts. So that's a local, that's a local duck. Here's a different duck. <laughs> this is a, a duck from um, California. This is a California duck. And what it is is, this is the drawing that that duck comes from. Okay, and the, the drawing is that if you look at the blue line at the top, that's the rather gentle curves of a load without any uh, photovoltaics. Then you, you see the, uh, the sinking blue lines as more and more photovoltaics are put on the grid and less and less power is needed during the time the photovoltaics are running. So there is the, 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 that's why, it's sort of shaped like a duck, so they call it a duck. I, these diagrams are from California ISO. It's actually from a blog about the duck uh, called Why is California Trying to Behead the Duck? You can look it up. <laughs> now remember that negative bit that the demand is low at night, but the wind blows at night, and the wind can't get paid unless it sells power to the grid, so it, it pays the grid to take the power. So other power plants can't run because they have to make way for wind because they can't pay the grid to take their power. They're not, they, only, they only get paid if they make power. So it's kind of the night duck. So here's, here's if you talk to people about renewables, they'll say base load is your daddy's grid. Yeah, it's your grandfather's grid. It's the, the old-fashioned, what was it, the Oldsmobile? Yeah. Uh, the new grid doesn't need base load. So look at the physical statement here. And the new grid, indeed, with lots of wind and solar, doesn't necessarily need base load. It needs backup power. It needs backup because the wind doesn't always blow at night. If the sun doesn't always shine clearly during the day. And when there's nothing, who are you going to call? And basically you call hydro and gas turbines for backup because steam plants can run too slowly. Excuse me, Mary. <coughs> and well, these slides and what you're talking about now, does that apply to the country at large or are you talking about New England? Well, actually I've been bobbing around the country 
the first slide was about New England, and the second slide was about um, California. And as a general rule, it tends to be windier at night most places, and or in the morning, or you know, T.S. Eliot, the wind sprang up at four o'clock, and um, the sun shines during the day everywhere. So th maybe they're basically pretty nationwide, much but maybe not for New Hampshire because <coughs> we don't have wind mills. Well, you have one. I've visited them. Oh, I know. I have two. <laughs> You were there. I was there. <laughs> and at the moment, the windmills were not just, it was during the day. Yeah, there was. The windmills were actually sucking power out of the grid to keep their systems alive. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That was, we, we were kind of, uh, we went into the windmill and we were, we were looking at the, what it was saying, and it was saying that it was taking power from the grid. So that isn't one of the things that's advertised. We were, there was an energy safari class, and uh, we, we were both on it. I mean, I was one of the leaders, but actually Bob Hargraves was the main leader. So that was the physical thing. The physical thing is that if we've got hydro, and uh, if we've got a lot of wind and solar, what we need is backup. That's physical. What about policy? The grid is headed toward renewables and natural gas backup for a lot of reasons, which is lovely now because natural gas is cheap. Okay. But natural gas pricing has historically been very, very volatile. And in the old days, in the integrated days, the utilities would not have allowed this in a way. They would have, they would have hedged against price changes on any given fuel by trying to have a mix on their grid. And ISO also thinks a mix should be on the grid. But ISO doesn't, with the way the auctions are set up and the way the renewables come on and the negative bidding and so forth, it really, the grid is going more and more toward 100% natural gas with, uh, as backup to renewables. Do we have enough natural gas coming into New England for that to be a viable thing? I mean, the Marcellus Shale is in New York and Pennsylvania. Do it's a huge amount of gas in the Marcellus Shale. It's yeah. pipeline constrained rather than gas constrained. However, <coughs> it's really hard to say. I mean, I am not going to predict how long the Marcellus Shale will be able to provide if we go to 100% uh, gas grid. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you can say, well, it's cheap now. There's a lot of it now. And it looks like there'll be a lot of it for quite a few but years. But is ISO New England getting enough now to integrate it into the mix so it's a great backup? It's a great backup. And, uh, and, and, if, it, and if England New England wants to go to renewables plus natural gas, there it will need more pipelines. And it will be very uh, sensitive to volatile pricing of natural gas. But there is nothing physical that would prevent it that I know of. I mean, I, I personally think that it would be better to have a, a, a mix of plants, but that doesn't mean I, I'm trying to try to change, tell the difference between physical and policy. And in my opinion, policy is a better mix, but it, it will work this way. So a little more on renewable interrelationship uh, policy. Um, I saw New England is concerned with New England grid being too heavily natural gas. Uh, on the other hand, Green Mountain Power loves renewables because they're a gas company. <laughs> so every time you hear them saying how great renewables were, you should remember that this doesn't mean it's hurting their bottom line. It doesn't mean that they're being mean or anything. I'm just saying that, uh, anyhow, uh, renewables means more gas backup. and. Uh, Hydro is also very flexible and uh, can be a backup for wind and solar. And um, Denmark uses Scandinavian hydro to back up Danish wind power. Uh, so when you look at, oh, Denmark got a huge amount of wind on its grid, yes, it does. And it, it has a great contracts with uh, Norway and I think Sweden, probably Norway, mostly Norway, uh, to use uh, hydro to back it up. Now, I, I work sometimes up in Washington State about some things and talk to them there. Uh, and uh, the Columbia River is the backup for the Washington State wind turbines. But using hydro to uh, back up a, uh, uh, wind turbines runs into problems 
because there's a lot of other factors in, in managing a river. There's a fish migration, flood control, uh, and so forth. And so you can't just say, well, we will turn on the hydro whenever. If, if you're letting the wind control your dams, then, then it isn't necessarily good for the ecology of the area. Even though it's, they're both zero, or very close to zero carbon dioxide emission situations. But, um, okay, and this was, this is, uh, I'm just getting snarky again. Uh, Robert Kennedy uh, addressed a bunch of oil and gas man, men, and you can see the film clip of it on Atomic Insights, and he said, for all those big utility scale power plants, whether it's wind or solar, everybody is looking at gas as a supplementary fuel. The plants that we're building, the wind plants and the solar plants, are gas plants. I didn't say it, Robert, uh, Robert, F. Kennedy Jr. said it. So, what okay, enough snark. Wait, wait, wait. What, what does he mean? <laughs> what does he mean? What does he mean? What does he mean? The wind plants are gas plants. I don't understand. He means that the wind doesn't always blow, and what you're going to back them up with is gas. So every time you put up a bunch of wind turbines, you require a bunch of gas plants. I think did I read not several years ago that T. Boone Pickens was planning to put up a lot of windmills. And he wanted the windmills because he had all that gas and mm. oil right. and fuel for the backup. So it wasn't the windmills he was really interested in. It was the fossil fuels that would be necessary as backup. Yes, that is absolutely the case. When Chibu Pickens likes wind turbines because he sells gas that way. But if the alternative is 100% gas, isn't that worse? Well, I'm. this isn't a course about Alternatives. I, the alternative to me would be low, low carbon dioxide nuclear power. But I'm, I'm uh, you know, I don't think you need to have uh, to say, oh, the only thing we've got is gas plants. But I'm not. It, this is a course about the grid, and it's not a course about my feelings about different kinds of power plants. I'm just trying to explain the way the grid is going, and I think the snarkiness here is to point out to people that renewables are backed up by natural gas. You cannot actually just build lots and lots of renewables and hope the hydro plants will back you up. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's the only point here. Enough snarky. Okay, backup for renewables also costs money because um, let's say the grid was 50% wind and the wind isn't blowing, you need an equal amount of gap backup for that wind. With traditional plants, you can figure out how much extra you need on the grid with failure estimates because you can assume that there won't be a common mode failure of uh, all the coal plants deciding to go offline at once. So you can say, oh, assuming that the two biggest coal plants go offline, we need this much backup. But w you can have a common mode failure for renewables, so you need more backup. So when I look at the situation, I think, boy, this is, haven't I seen this before? That's the trouble with being old. <laughs> is this a new way of overbuilding or what? I mean, don't you remember that rate of return business and overbuilding? Well, here we go again. But it's a, it's, it's a different, it's, it's coming at us a different way, but it, it is definitely coming at us. So now I'm going to go on to net metering, and Christine is going to talk a lot about this. So the duck is about the grid, the physical grid. It's not the same duck every day. And how fast does the grid need to ramp when the sun goes down is a physical issue. Now, if you notice, California is not happy camper about this. You see this ramp needed 1,300 megawatts in three, 13,000 megawatts in three hours. Now, look at that blue line up there before we have solar. It's kind of a gentle little line, isn't it? It moves along, you know, and so forth. But if you have a lot of PV solar, then you are going to have to ramp really fast. That is, the, that is the neck of the duck there. You see how fast it has to move. And um, there are physical issues with integrating such a rapid ramp up uh, of so much power. Now if you remember, imagine I, 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 Howard will be here next time along with Christine so you can ask questions about this. But imagine that there's been a major, a major bunch of plants have gone offline, a major bunch of transition lines have gone down, everybody's grass areas are out of power, and what happens? 
Well, we're bringing up at least, uh, you know, four counties by 2 o'clock this afternoon, and the next four will be up by 3 in the afternoon. And you bring, it up, you, you bring the grid back slowly. Here's a situation where you're going to bring up 1,300 megawatts in three hours because the sun went down. So it's a, it's a, a physical issue as well as a... And as I say, you can, you can have fun tomorrow with people who know more about that issue than I do. Okay, so here's, that was about physical constraints that could happen with, with photovoltaic. Uh, there are cost constraints. Um, if you're net metering, uh, the utility will pay 14 cents to a homeowner for what it would otherwise bore, for, say, 4 cents on the grid. The difference, the 10 cents, gets rolled into other people's bills. Some study states have had a lot of uh, 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 people taking up uh, net metering, and they find their prices going up. And Hawaii is eliminating retail net metering. Arizona is adding connection fees. Nevada is reducing rates. And you can go on to the, uh, I've sent you the, the link several times, Utility drop dive looks at 10 states and what they are doing about net metering. But the issue is that the cost constraints of uh, too much net metering are a policy issue. So net metering, when you hit the top, uh, then there's a cap and then people can't get on it. If you lower the prices that people get paid, people get a very upset. I invested and now you're paying us less. If somebody else doesn't, hasn't invested and they're uh, getting their, their prices are going up, and the nerders are boasting my electricity is free, it's a great. Uh, that, it's really it's, it's it's been an issue. It's a controversy, and um, my feeling once again, opinionated comment by Meredith Angwin. <laughs> if net metering had started by paying closer to grid rates, there would be less of it, but also less controversy because it wouldn't be raising general rates as much. So I was going to say let's talk, but I'm not going to because we're going to go on to the next controversy so that we can talk about everything. Uh, FERC 1000, the short version. Uh, I don't understand this well enough, um, and I'm not alone. Uh, I was at the Consumer Liaison Group of ISO New England, and there was a talk about it. And everybody was asking questions, and afterwards people were coming up and saying, that was a great question. I think I'm finally getting for 1,000. And these are people who go to these meetings and know a lot about the grid. This is you know, not an OSHA class. These are people who have driven to some place and gone, and their companies are paying for them to be there. Not in my case, but what the heck. So let's talk about transmission lines for a minute. If the line is needed for reliability, and once again, this is a an assessment done in general by ISO New England, is this line needed for reliability? Then the, the price of that transmission line, which may go through several states, is what they call socialized. Each state pays in accordance to how much load it has. The idea is the whole grid has to be reliable. This particular line is needed for reliability. The line happens to be between Connecticut and Massachusetts, but Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, we all pay for it because it's needed for reliability for the whole grid, and we pay in proportion to how big a state we are. So Vermont is 4% of the load of New England, and it pays 4% of the transmission line. This has worked for a really long time. It's been good. That is called socializing the cost. With the new rule, FERC 1000, if a state needs a line due to policy, not reliability, remember reliability is physical, policy is policy, then the cost will also be socialized. They will be less socialized, the state will pay 30% of the cost, and 70% uh, will be socialized. So here's a, um, here's a, here's a couple of, I've got a link here. Um, Connecticut wants access to Maine, let's say Connecticut wants access to Maine wind power. It has a renewed portfolio standard. It's a policy concern. It's not reliability. Everybody's lights are going on in Connecticut, but they have a renew they have a policy that they want wind power. They don't have much wind power. Maine has the wind power. 
under FERC 1000, Vermont will have to pay for part of those transmission lines. We won't get any good out of them. It's not our policy. But they're socializing the cost of it for policy reasons, for FERC 1000. So basically, Vermont really doesn't like this. And I have a link to um, uh, a VPR uh, statement from the president of the Vermont, the, the group that's in charge of transmission lines in Vermont, saying, we start from the position that those who stand to benefit from a transmission project in service of their public policy goals should fund the project. It seems like a straightforward statement. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, if uh, there's a New England group of uh, governors, NESCO, um, basically, if you look at it, here's ISO, it's doing its thing, right? Now, the elected officials, who, who on their staff is in charge of dealing with ISO? So, and, and who could be powerful against ISO? So they have started a group, a governor's group, where they, every a governor appoints some people to it and said, your deal is to defend our states against whatever might or might not be happening on the grid. You got to track it, you got to give us advice on it, and if necessary, you got to sue. So that's what's happening right now, that the NESCO group is suing um, uh, FERC for putting in this 1,000. So you heard it here first. Nobody, nobody in your, your circle of acquaintance will probably be very anxious about FERC 1,000. So uh, <laughs> there we go. So, oh, sorry. What, what's the what's the other side of the argument? What why, what does FERC say? Uh, why does they say they need this rule? There must be some reason. They say that they need this rule because public policy is very important and putting renewables on is very important and if people have a policy that and that, that says uh, you, you they need renewables then everybody should pay for it and it, it's a, a good a good for society and and therefore for example let's say that there's a um, a uh, a lot of wind in North Dakota, and let's say Chicago decides that they're going to, to use this wind, and they're going to run a DC line to North Dakota, and a whole new fancy transmission line. Well, everybody should pay for it. This is a good thing. You see, that's that would be Ferg's argument. Okay. But then you mean everybody, like in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the team should pay for it? Uh, yeah, it would be it. socialized onto the New England uh, payment system, whatever that is. And I really, like I say, there are so many exceptions to everything that I really can't get into like, uh, how the New England transmission system is paid through the uh, MISO, it's called, Midwest ISO. Um, but basically, yes, it would be like, yeah, we're going to socialize it through, uh, a lot of people are going to pay for it because it's a, it's a policy of the state of Illinois to get that wind energy here. Okay, uh, then the, the, oh, I may actually be done. Oh my God, this is fabulous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, yeah, it is. Oh, <laughs> I did it, I did it. <laughs> so that the last, um, the last uh, slide here, here, a real slide about, about things is that uh, Vermont, this is another, uh, another controversy, and one that you have heard about, unlike FERC 1000, uh, Vermont doesn't have a renewable portfolio standards, therefore we don't use RECs. We have other ways to say utilities must buy renewables, uh, speed programs, feed-in tariff programs, all kinds of things. Uh, but we allow the renewables to make um, renewable energy certificates, which we don't use, and well, but nowadays we're talking about retiring them in Vermont, so maybe we'll begin to use them. But we sell these renewable energy certificates to uh, other states, whose, who utilities in other states whose utilities are required to buy them. So uh, are we cheating? 
That is, are we counting things twice, or is it somebody else's business? And you could look at it from the point of view of the canny little farmer who says, well, here in Vermont, we insist there's actually a building with a renewable something on it, a wind turbine or a photovoltaic. If those city guys just want to buy certificates, hey, we'll sell them. You know, I mean, you could look at it that way, or you could look at it that it's just plain double dealing. Whichever way it is, Vermont utility rates over the, over the state of Vermont are lowered by $50 million a year by the sale of these certificates. So if you decide that, no, this is really not a good idea, we are going to be honest engine from now on, you're going to have to see your bills go up. But maybe, maybe we don't want to do that. Uh, again, policy issues. So, this is the final slide, and I can't believe I made it. <laughs> I think I'll retire now. <laughs> um, I want to conclude by saying that I know a lot of acronyms, but acronyms aren't policy. And in my opinion, all this complexity and all these acronyms basically hide the policy decisions. My purpose in, in, in giving this course was to lift the curtain a little bit about what decisions even have been made. I mean, you know, what decisions have been made? What did, who's making them? Your question about ISO is absolutely wonderful. I have never really thought to ask who appoints the commissioner of ISO. I don't know. I would also say that ISO New England is comparatively transparent. Every De December, there's uh, an, uh, a, a meeting of the Consumer Liaison Group that I'm in uh, the Coordinating Committee for. And that meeting takes place always in downtown Boston, which I hate. Because going into downtown Boston and getting my car into some kind of parking garage and getting to the fancy hotel and all this, I mean, why is it here? Why every December do you do these things to us? And the answer is because there's a FERC and NEPOL meeting here. Well, New England Power Pool and FERC meet there in Boston around December, around the same time. So people who uh, are really paid to do this sort of stuff can come into town, stay at a hotel, and go to all the meetings. And so it works well. I can't attend those meetings. I don't think they're open to the public. Uh, so I talked to the people who are going to go to them, and I said, oh, yeah, that's going to be really interesting. I'm not sure some of them may be open to the public. I do not want to be totally quoted on that, and she says they're closed. But I don't think they're open to the public. I, some of them are at least not open to the public. And um, compared to that, I see New England is transparent. Okay? So. Uh, yes, you did tell us there was a meeting open to the public in the middle of June. In that's yeah. That's my meeting. I mean, it's not my that's meeting. The that's meeting the, you go to. That's the meeting I go to that I'm on the coordinating committee to plan. And everybody should take Dartmouth coach and not drive to Boston. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the team. That actually will work for uh, everyone here. It doesn't work for me because the coordinating committee meets in the morning for the main meeting in the afternoon, and it would be pretty awful to try to get to a 9 o'clock meeting in downtown Boston. I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty fierce. Anyway, I agree. Okay, so I just want to say that um, at a deep level, we're all responsible for the grid, and the grid is responsible to us. And we just have to know what's going on in it in order to make choices, and that is why I gave this class, even though, frankly, it's very anxiety-provoking to try to get this much information. Uh, it, 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 anyway, I'm happy to have given it, but um, I just feel people have to know what's going on and we won't make any choices. The, 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 the headline comes, the headline goes, and it's like, what was that? So. What choice do we have, though, to right. select another electric company? <laughs> In Vermont, we don't have a choice. I don't have a choice. You just pay the bill. Pay the bill, and I can't say, well, I don't like your rates, I'm going to go somewhere else. That's mm -hmm. true. I, I, maybe we can do something about that. Deregulation was supposed to give consumers choices, 
It doesn't really work that way most of the places. Yes? Why does ISO keep just doing this tweaking business? Don't they need to sort of start over again? And then well, no. I mean, I, I, I think that there are a lot of things that could be started over again. But basically, ISO was set up, the idea was that the market would take care of the excesses. The auctions would happen, the market would take care of the excesses, and life would be better. But then they discovered that it didn't really work that way. They, 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 they had to put in the, the, uh, the capacity auctions, they had to deal with the Enrons of the world who were quite willing to, to raise the prices on the grid by hook or by crook, and so forth. So it, they just keep keep uh, keep tweaking our way at it. And uh, as I say, I, I, anybody who wants to look up some of these subjects, and and you know we can report on it or whatever. I okay. I have actually. Oops. I actually want to talk about the next class just for a moment here. We'll have our guest speaker, and then we'll talk about grid controversies. And I think. We can just start by making a list of what we want to ask when we get to ISO New England. Because we will meet Mary Nuara, who is the person I've quoted. And we will go into the uh, control room. So we will have a lot of access to what's going on when we go there. And also in the next class, we have to discuss the carpools for the field trip, um, if, uh, if we can form some carpools. So OK. Does anybody have some comments on, oh. I have one comment about <clears throat> the fact that we haven't talked much about the environment and what, what the, the whole grid is doing in terms of uh, global warming and all this. Uh, I have a solar panel system at my house and we're putting excess power into the grid and, and I see the problem of the solar situation day, but nowadays we have, we know that natural gas is not uh, <coughs> infinite, and there's all sorts of uh, objections to fracking of the Marcellus, and that's what, you know, we've seen that this gas line in southern New Hampshire has been withdrawn, and that's largely over the fracking issue. Same things happening up in Middlebury, Vermont, where they where they have a, have had a lot of controversy. Uh, I think we ought to be thinking more about how the whole system works in regard to uh, <coughs> atmospheric uh, problems and global warming. And and I wonder if if we had a a lot of solar and wind, and we had the non gas plant backup. I mean, weather forecasting is not a is not a uh, known science, but they do pretty well nowadays. We know when we're going to have cloudy days. We know when we're going to have pretty much sunny days. Uh, I don't hear in our discussion now much of that sort of thing, much less the problem we have with the Wilder Dam and, and communities like mine and Lyme, where the roads are crumbling into the river because of this up and down problem with the with the water level. So th these are concerns and interests of mine, anyway. Well, I agree with you about many of the things you said. But I, I, the thing is that it is, there are many, I'm, I'm going to just say that there are, are many forms that are set up all over the upper valley <coughs> to discuss environmental effects of various power sources. And I, I would be delighted to discuss it, but I decided that Everybody knows something about that. And what I wanted to present was something that I thought people should know about and don't know about. Now, if you say, well, you are not, um, you are not giving enough credit to the need for the grid to have <coughs> low carbon, uh, low impact power. And the answer is, I'm not actually, except for my stocking paper statements every now and again, I wasn't actually saying that much about where the power comes from. I was just trying to say how how the grid buys the power, how it 
how it pays for transmission of the power, what effect this had, and so forth. For example, that whole thing where um, I, I, uh, I said that the, um, there's a very complex rule about, uh, about uh, pay, uh, paper performance fines. That has absolutely nothing to do with what kind of power plant. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at it a different way, uh, the negative bidding does have to do with the power plant because it's been a policy decision that certain kinds of power plants get wrecks, they get paid for something besides their kilowatt hours, and therefore they can bid in negative. So that is a power de policy decision in favor of renewables. I was just trying to show its effect on the grid. Like I say, I don't. I think that we all feel we know a fair amount, and we probably all do know, this is, this is a great class, a great group of people about, um, about different kinds of power plants and their effects. But I guess the thing is, I, I think that we have to begin looking at the, how the grid encourages and discourages power plants and how they're paid for and so forth also, and that's what I was doing in this class. So, anyway, yeah, yes. And as a side note, she brought up the one thing that when you talk about your concerns, and that is we can't store it in batteries. And so, on one hand, you've got public policy of how we're gonna police each other about usage. And the best example I can think is I had a rental with, when my daughter was in college, and I had one gal, I called her kilowatt, because the thing is, I'd go in there, she'd have a heater going, she was going to classes all day, and you know, she'd have a, 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 she'd leave her TV on, the beast, I mean, I just said she drove me nuts because we also inclusively set price, including electricity. So I really called her kilowatt to the, you know. But I mean, that's the thing is, how are you gonna govern your neighbor on usage? That, I mean, and that's what's causing them to dips, but there's nowhere to store this energy. So the importance of the grid is how does it create a constant availability for whenever the demand is there. So I, I mean, I see you're giving us the inside, which has been really beneficial because it's a big beast, but it's also one that somehow is working. Mm -hmm. Because I don't worry about when I flip on my switch, you know. There have been a lot of studies. I, I, I wrote a really, uh, okay, here, I'm, uh, I wrote a really annoyed article one time uh, about um, there's too many uh, places that say, oh, well, we're just gonna move the demand a little bit. Now, I don't tend to turn on my dishwasher at eight in the afternoon, at eight in the evening. I can set it to go on later because, of, you know, I mean, I, there are some simple things you can do about demand. But when you get right down to it, people are not going to begin cooking dinner at 11 at night because the demand is low there. <laughs> and uh, similarly, people are not going to, um, what really got to me was the number of places, including a Green Mountain Power ad, that said, showed uh, people running their washing machines in the middle of the night. And I thought, I raised a couple of kids, and I assure you, if that washing machine is running, somebody is up running it, making sure that the clothes go out before they sit there wet for a long time and get wrinkled, or maybe you've got, or maybe you have one that will go immediately to a dryer cycle, but then you gotta pull it out. I mean, I just was like, what are they talking about? What they're trying to do is to set up uh, situations where you can think that you can change the, the load curve, but the load curve is basically, it's changeable. But when you get right down to it, there are nocturnal mammals and there are diurnal mammals, and we happen to not be a nocturnal mammal, and that's the way it is, so <laughs> yes. The question I have is, what are we going to do about a national, uh, national grid to tie together the eastern grids and the western grids so that they can share loads when necessary? Well, there are ties between most of the grids, but they're only limited ties. There's only limited ties. Uh, and that's basically for, uh, for stability and, and managing the, the subsection. But, I mean, we have a tie in, to, we have ties to New York. We have ties to Quebec. Uh, if you go to the Midwest, there, there's ties to PGM to, but they're limited because because it, you know you, you need something that you can manage, and then you can say, oh, and we can 
can go out and come back from that, as opposed to I'm trying to manage. I mean, I'm trying to manage the whole West. Um, Howard Schaefer, I don't have. I have a slide on it here. I don't know if it's worth our time when we have like eight minutes left to try and find it. But he showed one slide with with the links between the different uh, the different areas. Yeah. There were questions earlier about ISO New England and its makeup and how people were appointed and that sort of thing. If you go to their website, uh, you can look at the bios and photos of their board, their officers, and they even have, if you want to read it, copies of their bylaws and their certificate of incorporation and all the usual. It sounds like any corporation. I haven't seen anything that jumps out that says the board is appointed by blah blah blah, but maybe that's that should be in the bylaws. I would assume if you I really yeah. are interested, you could probably find the answer. There. That's a really good point. I should have just looked it up that way. I just tend to think of ISO New England as sort of there. It's there <laughs> and it's making rules, and I I'm mostly more at the level of like what are the rules that it's making rather than uh, who who appoints it. But th that just shows my yes. I had an item of interest, perhaps. I used to live in California, and the Pacific Gas and Electric Company had bought up hundreds and hundreds of miniature uh, hydro plants. And you'd be out in the woods, and you'd see a ditch going by, and you'd follow the ditch for a half mile, and then there's a pipe, and there's a little little tiny generator running. And they, they must have thousands of those running all over California that when they purchased and built the PG&E, assemble all those little generators and they're still operating. They've got people out there making sure the ditches are clean and the things are running. We don't have that in New England to my knowledge. Um, <laughs> there was a generating station in Piermont, just below the bridge where Route 10 goes over the stream, right at uh -huh. the bottom of Piermont. Just downstream, uh, there was a dam and a generating station. It still is. Still is. Okay, yeah, you live in Piermont too. Mm -hmm. And presumably, whoever owned that was selling their power to the to, to the grid or to uh, the power company. It was also in the '70s a big push for that with what was called PURPA, um, where you uh, qualifying facilities where you uh, small generators owned by individuals who were the, and utilities were required to buy their output. So a lot of small dams were put in, in those days. I just one in Bradford, I mean, fairly, West Fairly, Vermont. Part of the home. Yeah, and there's a generating station up in Bradford, Vermont. <coughs> Springfield has a couple. <coughs> yeah. It still is. Yeah, that, uh, that, that works. I mean, yeah. I, I had a question, and I know it can't be answered in three minutes, but maybe there's a one minute summary that, that you or somebody knows. I grew up in a town down in Western Maryland, and I remember. In those years, there was a what was always called an investor-owned power company. I think it was vertically integrated, yes. the kind you're describing, <coughs> in the 1950s. Yes. There was also the municipal power plant, right. um, which was coal-fired. And on many streets in the town, one set of lines went down one side of the street, and the other set went down the other side of the street. And you could buy for either one or probably for both. What, how did that come about? Is that something that came out of the Depression, or, or what, what, what's the history of that? I, I, I can't give the entire history. The public power has always been a part of power. It isn't very big around here. Uh, but in, in, in the West, uh, there are huge, uh, Seattle Power and Light, uh, uh, um, Bonneville Power. Uh, uh, it was kind of funny um, when I was at Electric Power Research Institute it was located and still is, I believe, in, in Palo Alto. And uh, Palo Alto is, is in PG&E territory, except Palo Alto had its own municipal utility. And, and there were a lot of like enclaves of municipal utilities. That's what, how that grew, I don't know. It's rare, though. I'll tell you that it is rare to have the choice. In other words, if you're in Palo Alto, you buy from the Palo Alto Municipal Utility. If you're in um, Mountain View, you buy from PG&E. That was the, 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 the more standard way to do it. The, the free enterprise enthusiasts were always critical of this arrangement, and the municipal plant in my hometown did close years and years ago. So now there's just the one. 
<laughs> well, there's, there's always been uh, a tension between investor-owned and municipals, and, and but I, I decided that from the point of view of understanding the grid, I just I just couldn't no, cover I just, those I, things. I, 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 I just, I just couldn't. It just that. really isn't Burlington Electric a public? I believe it is. Yes, it's a municipal. Um, owned by the people who buy the power. Does that mean that they're part of us? Are they oh yeah, they're integrated. Everything's integrated. If you if you can turn on a light, it's integrated. From a, 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 a power line, it's integrated into ISO. Okay. And it's a, a Palo Alto Municipal Utility is integrated into uh, um, a California ISO. Some of the municipal utilities have their own power plants. Others of them are basically purchasing agents where they get they get a good deal because they buy in bulk from 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 the grid or they buy in bulk from. Uh, from, from some power plant, you know, they make a contract with the power plant to get a good price and, and so forth. Um, in many states where there are rules about uh, how long your contracts can be, uh, how long a utility can write a power purchase agreement for with a generator, the municipals have more generous rules and the investor owns are, are held to like shorter, shorter, uh, shorter time frames of writing. Things. But then again, that's state by state, and we could we would have to really get into it to <laughs> to get down to the state by state. So, everybody, I guess I can close now and just let people chat. And <laughs> and I'm I'm looking forward to uh, Christine um, being here next week, and I hope uh, I hope that we'll have some good conversations with her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.